welcome to today's Community Cast. My name is Matt Morgan. I'm the pastor at Community Brookside, a new church plant in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are so blessed by your presence, and we hope that today's content will bring you joy. All right, friends, so we're continuing on in our sermon series called All In, uh, and we're going to talk about a biblical character I think we've talked about before, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper. So in times of fear and uncertainty, it can be difficult to remain faithful, can't it? Right? In moments when your life gets tough, sometimes it's hard for us to remember God in those moments. I want to tell you a story. During World War II, there was a British soldier who was captured by the Germans. He was taken as a prisoner of war. He was sent to a camp where the conditions were harsh and the prisoners were treated poorly. We know that that's reality. One day, the soldier was caught reading his Bible. The German guard who caught him ordered him to hand it over, and he threatened to punish him if he was ever caught reading it again. But the soldier refused to give up his Bible. He knew that it was his source of strength and his source of hope, and he refused to let the soldier dictate what he was going to do with his own Bible. So the guard was taken aback by the soldier's bravery and his determination. He had never seen anyone stand up to him or the Germans before, especially in that way. Over time... The guard began to observe the soldier and his fellow prisoners more closely. He saw how they remained faithful, even in the midst of their suffering, even in the midst of the hardest days of their lives. They drew strength from their faith in God. Eventually, the guard began to question his own beliefs and the actions of his government and his country. He himself began to secretly read the Bible and eventually turned his life over to Jesus and became a Christian. The soldier's faith had not only sustained him through those difficult times when he was able to read his little Bible, but by standing up in the midst of his fear, even in some of the scariest times of his life, it also impacted the life of his captor. This story reminds us that remaining faithful in the midst of fear is not only important for our own spiritual well-being, but it can also impact the lives of people around us. So let me ask you this question. Have you ever been in a situation where you had to choose between standing up to what, for what you believe in or compromising your beliefs to avoid conflict? Have you ever done that before? Oftentimes, for, for many of us, it's like in little tiny ways, isn't it? Things we choose not to say or things we have to bite our tongues to keep from saying because somebody challenges us. It's not a situation that we face super often in the U.S. because, let's face it, our country is the home of religious freedom. There are so many people who believe like us who are Christians that oftentimes we're not challenged in the way that many other Christians around the world are. However, there are always moments like the one we just heard about in that story. In one way or another, oftentimes in small or unassuming ways, we are challenged to put our faith behind the will of our bosses maybe the will of our friend groups, or even sometimes we have to compromise our faith even when we're around our extended families. Not often as, is it as extreme as the example of the soldier who kept his Bible, but sometimes, sometimes we are simply pressured to not talk about the church or our faith when we're around others who we feel might disagree with us, right? I think many of us have found ourselves in that situation. So when we go to Thanksgiving dinner with our family, what are the two things we can't talk about? Politics and religion, right? And it's weird because I have this family that every time we get together at Thanksgiving, that's what comes up all the time. But those are the things that we're not supposed to be talking about. Friends, aren't we supposed to be talking about Jesus everywhere we go, right? But we, in those moments, we recognize that it might cause conflict, and so we have to compromise what we believe, and we have to be careful in what we say. We intentionally do not talk about faith because sometimes our faith makes other people uncomfortable. Or sometimes nowadays we have understood the fact that religion can be divisive in a way that we've not seen in our recent history, right? And here's what's weird. When I tell people that I have a church that looks very broad, right? So we have people in this building who both love Donald Trump and hate Donald Trump, right? We have people in this building who both love Joe Biden and hate Joe Biden, don't we? What's most important is our relationship with one another and our relationship to the king that matters, 
not so much our own politics, right? And people are questioning me all the time, what do you mean? Sometimes, even in this room, we have to make compromises on what we believe in to maintain order and to continue to be able to have deep conversations with people that we love. But sometimes, being fearful about the potential of talking about our faith might cause us to compromise what we believe in ways that we might never have thought been possible. Fear is a powerful force, isn't it? Especially when that fear is one of persecution or one of hurt or one of loss or especially when it comes to death. Like I don't even wanna think about the fear of death. Another example of how fear can impact our willingness to stand firm in our faith might simply look like us being led to doubt God's goodness. When we're fearful, when bad things start happening to us, that, that maybe God isn't as good as we think he is, we start to question our own faith. We doubt because sometimes we end up blaming God when bad things happen in our lives. And guys, let me remind you that God does not want bad things to happen. We live in a broken world that is filled with people who are disobedient and sinful just like all of us. And when bad things happen, it's, it's not because God is punishing you. It's because we live in a broken world. But can God be good if God allows pain and hurt in our world, right? Sometimes our fear of what's happening to us causes us to question God. Sometimes fear will cause us to turn to worldly solutions when we have a hard time in our lives, doesn't it? People can get wrapped up in worldly things such as drugs or alcohol. We may stop relying on our faith in God and instead put our faith in man-made escapes from reality that, that make us feel better. At other times when we deal with fear, we may abandon prayer and worship altogether. Sometimes if we don't believe that God is as good as God says he is, why would I go to church? Why do I need to pray? And worst of all, fear might cause us to lose our hope that things will ever get better. Have you ever been that fearful in your life? Where you question, can it get any better from this moment? We might compromise our faith by giving up on God's promises and losing sight of the hope that we have in a God who loves us and sustains us. Do you understand that fear is a powerful thing? I'm sorry. Do you understand that fear is a powerful thing? Yes. And what should be even more powerful than fear is our faith and our trust in God. So think about it, friends. Do you ever feel that your faith in God is more powerful than the spirit of fear that sometimes invades our lives? Do you believe that God is bigger than any situation that you find yourselves in? And that's sometimes hard to say in the midst of those moments, isn't it? Right? The great news is that even in the hardest moments of our lives where God seems so far away from us and our faith is tested, the good news is that scripture gives us an exact example of how we can pattern our lives and we can believe fully in God, even in the midst of some of the most fearful moments that we find ourselves. This morning, we're gonna be talking about Stephen, who was the first uh, he was a first century Christian who lived just after the time of Jesus. And he lived during a time where the church really needed strong leadership. The church was struggling, right? It was a band of very few believers who sometimes had to hide themselves up in upper rooms. They had to meet together in, in private because they were fearful that they would end up just like Jesus was crucified. And it just so happens that Stephen was a man who was strong in his faith. And we'll talk more about that here in a moment. But Stephen was the first Christian martyr. In the midst of his fear, his life was ended. And we're going to talk about what it looks like in those moments where we're fearful of even death. So we're going to start in the book of Acts. If you have a Bible, I invite you to pull it out, make some notes in the margin, feel free to underline. But if you don't have a Bible, you can read along on the screen. This is coming from the book of Acts, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Let's read what God has for us today. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. 
Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man who was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parma, uh, Parmenius, sorry, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So uh, I'm reminded when I read this that if you just read it with confidence, no one will question you, but when you back up and say, bleh, 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 uh, you missed it. All right, so some of these names are not uh, you know, familiar. So uh, in this moment, from the beginning of the scripture, we see that there's an agenda among the people who are meeting together in worship. So it says the... Hellenistic Jews are being charged by the Hebraic Jews because the Hellenistic Jews are not taking care of the Hebraic Jews, widows, and orphans. Do you follow that, right? So the Hellenistic Jews are the Greeks, right? So the converts to Christianity, the converts to Judaism, and those folks are being racist against the, did I get that backwards? I think I did. Some of the Greek and Gentile widows were not being fed because it was the Hebrews who were born Jews were racist against the Gentiles. It's a really good thing we don't see that in the church today, right? I'm so thankful that there's, there are no issues like that ever facing. There's no agenda of discrimination. Everybody's held to the, oh, you laughed. Okay, all right. So the Hebraic Jews are the folks who grew up Jewish. They are Hebrew by both nationality and their faith. Therefore, when they treat converted Jewish Christians differently, we can see that there's a type of discrimination against those particular widows. They are not being fed. They're being overlooked in the disbursement of food. And friends, widows during this time, we've talked about this a thousand times in here, they had no rights. They had no ability to inherit property. If their husbands passed away, they were hopefully taken in with another younger family member, probably a son or a nephew, but if they didn't have any children or close relatives, they would have been left on their own to beg. And so the church began to take care of the widows and the orphans. The church said, there's a need, let's meet it. And then the problem was now that there's this division and there's, there's kind of this racism going on, there's this discrimination happening. Uh, the disciple says, listen, the 12 apostles, they get together and they say, listen, it, we are called to something different than it says waiting on tables, right? And that's a weird way to say that. But the disciples have a calling that is different than the one that meets the needs of the, the widows in this time. And so they do what we see as the very first um, anointing of deacons in the church. So these people are anointed to a very specific task. They are to feed the widows. And one of them is Stephen. Stephen is specifically talked about uh, out of the seven as being a man who is full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. He is honored specifically among the others, and this is important for the rest of his story. So let's read on. We're starting in Acts 6, 8 through 15. It says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against his wisdom that the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasph blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and they brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. What do you think of when you think about the face of an angel? Innocence, right? Like I always think of like the little cherub who's got like the little wings and he's like a little fat baby, <laughs> right? And he's got the little bow and the arrow. Like I know that's very pagan, but I, I think it's like, like the little fat cheeks of this perfect little cute little angel and there's Stephen like, uh. No? I... no? Uh -uh. What do you think of? 
like me, Wide yeah. Long. Strong. Okay. Yeah. Or like Michael. Yeah, you know that the Left Behind series is not biblical, right? Like, you know that? <laughs> okay, all right. So, yeah, so oftentimes we have different understandings of what an angel looks like, right? So Michael is, uh, you know, this angel that's supposed to be like this archangel that's big and strong and tough, but I always think cherub, right? Like, that's, that's the angel I think of. And so they look around, and they, they're throwing all these accusations at Stephen, and everybody looks at him intently. How do you look at somebody intently, Right? And he has the face of an angel. That's an interesting phrase. So we see here that he's not only full of the spirit of God, but he's also full of God's grace and God's power. He's becoming popular because he's doing miracles around uh, in, in the different areas that he finds himself. And anyone, as you know, who gains popularity, anyone who gains popularity sometimes becomes a target, right? Right? Especially when your popularity challenges somebody else who already has popularity. You've seen all those like feuds back and forth on Twitter between the celebs like Ariana Grande and I don't know anybody else famous, but like if I did, she's probably fighting with them, right? Like and Rihanna and all those things, right? Because people who are popular just want to stay popular and they'll do whatever it takes to remain that way, right? And we see the exact same thing is happening in the synagogues of the freedmen, right? Because they disagree with Christianity in total. The synagogue of freedmen is a synagogue. It is a Jewish, historically Jewish place of worship, right? They don't believe Jesus is the son of God, whereas now this Christian Jewish movement believes that Jesus is the son of God. He was the Messiah, and we have put him to death, right? And so theologically, they are opposed to one another, but because Stephen is gaining so many converts to the Christian faith, they have to start a rumor and again, it's a good thing we don't see anything like that in churches today, right? Right? So they start these rumors that he's blaspheming against the Jerusalem temple, and he's also blaspheming against the ways of Moses. Starting rumors to challenge his authority. So they begin this trial, and it's based on nothing but these false charges. People were literally sought out to lie in court about these charges. And as testimony commences, we see the witnesses talk about how Stephen claimed that Jesus was going to destroy the temple and he was going to change the customs of Moses. And then when they look at Stephen, he's like an angel. So we have to continue on and I'm going to summarize a lot of what's happening later on. And so as chapter seven goes on, uh, the high priest looks over at Stephen and then asks him if these charges are true. Stephen, are you a blasphemer? And instead of just answering the question, Stephen starts to preach. He just goes to town. He takes them on a walk down history lane of the Hebrew people. It's a strong sermon that he gives. He's trying to prove that there is nothing blasphemous about what he is saying. So he starts to give a lesson on scripture, starting with Abraham. And he calls, uh, he talks about how Abraham was called by God to leave his homeland and to go to the promised land that Abraham left in faith, doing what God had asked. Then he continues to talk about Abraham's promised son, Isaac. And then he talks about Isaac's son, Jacob. And then he talks about how Jacob's 12 sons became the 12 patriarchs, the 12 tribes of Israel. Then Stephen talks about the famine that struck all of Israel and all of the ancient world and how Joseph was put in the right spot at the right time by God to make a difference in all the world. And Joseph became second in command behind Pharaoh in Egypt. He allowed the Hebrew families to come and live in a part of Egypt that was plentiful and bountiful. And then he started talking about uh, the, the exodus from the, the, the slavery that they had in Egypt he tells them how Moses led his people out of bondage and they faced the hands of uh, the Egyptians and, and how Moses received the Ten Commandments and all of this history is being given. And then later in chapter 7, he talks about how the tabernacle of the Lord was made in the wilderness as a dwelling for God so that God could have a place to show up in the midst of his people. And eventually there was a temple that was built by Solomon. And that's where we're going to pick up. 
So in Acts 7, 44 through 8, 3, it says this. And this is Stephen talking. He says, our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant with law with them in the wilderness. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern that he had seen. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for God, for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon, his son, who built a house for God. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? This is a solid teaching. Like he's going to town on these folks. And then he says, you stiff-necked people. Guys, have you ever tried to win an argument? Do you ever win an argument when you start calling people names? Yes? Wrong. A teenager says that. She'll learn, right? No, when you start resorting to name calling, people are done, right? So here's Stephen in the midst of trial, right? And at this point in the history of the world, when you're brought up on a church trial, you don't only get excommunicated. They don't kick you out of the church. They may murder you, right? Right? If I was standing there in front of the Sanhedrin, I probably would not say, you stiff-necked people. That's like saying, hey, you dummies, right? You stiff-necked people, 51. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you, you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. Guys, this is getting serious and juicy. (laughs) You guys, you are the ones who were predicted. You had the law and the law said the righteous one is coming and then you murdered him. You guys did that. There's a lot of finger pointing. Calling names bringing up truth. Sometimes those things get people upset. So let's hear the response. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were so excited and they repented of their sins. Oh, wait. No, that's, oh, that's not what it says. Oh. It says, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. Can anybody gnash your, gnash your teeth at me, would you? Let me see what that looks like. Okay, so that's a good one. Keep trying. No, Michael's got it. Michael's like, no, I don't. (laughs) Michael has gnashed his teeth before. So I I don't really know what that looks like. I'm sure it's like, got not just the the teeth, but you got to get the lips like high so they can see the teeth. The gnashing of teeth, right? But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and started yelling at the top of their voices. Who does that? Levi did that when he was four. La, 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 <laughs> right? I don't want to hear what you're trying to talk about right now, crazy person. And so they're gnashing teeth covering their ears and acting like toddlers. And they all rushed him. And 58 says, they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a man, young man named Saul. And friends, this is what we call foreshadowing, all right? Verse 59 says, when they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And friends, that does not mean he was taking a nap. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. 
So there's a lot to unpack here. We're not going to go into Saul, but let's focus on Stephen. Stephen was brought up on false charges, and because of his prophetic voice against the leaders of the synagogue, he was stoned to death. He was murdered. Could you, be, could you, could you even imagine being brought up in front of your, all of your peers on false charges? Could you imagine that? Imagine for just a moment that you happen to be a successful business owner in Tulsa, right? You've been running this business for years. You've worked really hard to build your business and your reputation. You're proud of what you've done. But one day, everything changes. You get a phone call from the police. They're telling you that you've been accused of a crime that you know you didn't commit. They say that you've been implicated in a major fraud scheme. And there's evidence even against you. Think about the feelings that you would have. You're shocked, you're confused, you're embarrassed, you're afraid. You know you haven't done anything wrong, but you know that the legal system can sometimes be unforgiving, can't it? Over the next few weeks, your life becomes a living nightmare. You're constantly worried about what will happen to your business. You're worried about your reputation. You're worried about your family. Am I gonna be able to provide? Do I have to move? Am I gonna be able to afford the lifestyle I've built for my family and my, my, my life? You feel like everything that you're doing, you, you have to walk on eggshells, afraid to say or do anything because it's gonna be used against you, not even in the court of law, but also in the court of opinion. You hire a lawyer, but the cost is too exorbitant, and you're not even sure you can pay for the legal fees. Meanwhile, the media has caught wind of the story, and they're playing you as the villain. They're publishing articles with your name and your picture, insinuating that you're a criminal. You feel like you're being judged by the whole world, and there's nothing in your power that you can do to stop it. You can't defend yourself against false accusations when all you have is your lone voice and people who are paid actors to speak against you. And that's exactly the way that Stephen ended up. Friends, we might not all face trials that look like this, or like the one that Stephen faced. But there might come a time in your life when you're falsely accused of something. And in that moment, we need to look at how Stephen responded. He spoke nothing but the truth. He went all the way back in time. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, all of the history, and then you guys killed the prophets and destroyed Jesus. If we speak the truth, it doesn't matter what happens to our mortal body because we know that we have eternity with God to look forward to. The promise of God is that we can take to heart in knowing that we are not alone when we deal in those moments of fear. God is with us. He's never going to leave us or forsake us. We can trust in him, in his goodness, in his justice, knowing that in the end, truth is going to prevail. We know that Stephen was falsely accused because the truth came out, right? There's, it's written down here. People were falsely accusing him. They know it was a lie. The truth will always come out. And Stephen trusted. He trusted in God's goodness and God's justice. In the scariest moment of his life, he literally sees the face of God and his Savior standing next to God. Even through his fear, he recognizes that God didn't leave him because God is there in that moment. He knows that God was with him and the words that he spoke were words of truth. Speaking to the hearts of the religious leaders and calling them into account for the persecution of the prophets and the murder of Jesus. Without a doubt, even in the midst of one of the most fear-inducing moments of Stephen's life, he was all in. His faith never wavered, and he spoke strongly against those who accused him. He knew that he had done nothing wrong, but would not back down when it came time to speak about his faith, right? He told everybody everything that he believed. He was a faithful Christian who loved Jesus and was powerfully equipped to make converts to the Christian faith too. And even when he was talked bad about, and he, even when he was ridiculed, even when he was lied about, he remained faithful to God. He was all in. 
Friends, the reality of this story is that this still happens, right? Things that we say or don't say can be used against us to create a false narrative. Our lives are not ever guaranteed to be easy or perfect. But the gift of this story for us is that we can be strong in those moments, even when our lives feel like they're falling apart. Just like Stephen never turned his back on God or walked away from his faith when it got hard and messy, this shows us that when we are all in, we don't have to turn back on our faith either. We have the strength to do exactly what Stephen does. He has set a perfect example for us when our lives are made fearful. When we are all in, we can stand firm knowing that even when life is tough, God is right there with us. God is loving us even if we can't see him, even when we don't realize it. And the best way for us to remain all in when life gets hard and fear overtakes us is to know who our God is. We have to read scripture that tells us about this God who created us and sustains us, created us in his own image to be like us, or for us to be like him, really. And God equips us with the power of his Holy Spirit. We also have to spend time in prayer, friends. We have to tell our God about our hurts, And then we have to stop and listen for our God to speak. And that's where I think most of us struggle. We also need to continue to come to church to edify our faith through strong accountability type relationships with our brothers and sisters. We need to pray for others and ask for prayer from them for the people that we love. When we continue to feed into our spiritual lives, we will be equipped in the same manner that Stephen was to stand strong, even in the midst of some of the most fearful moments of our lives. But we have to train ourselves upright to do it. We have to continually build up our spiritual lives. And friend, I think think we need all of us to do that. We need solid Bible study. We need strong friendship relationships. We need a deep understanding of who God is through reading scriptures. We need a strong prayer life. We need to be all in. So friends, today and always, may each of us be as all in as Stephen was. May the challenges of the world take a backseat to our strong faith in a God who loves us even in the midst of fear and hardship. May our faith be as strong as Stephen when it matters most and may our love of God impact others and draw them to see how good God is just as Stephen's life does. Friends, let our all-in love of God help us to change the world every single day. Thank you so much for joining us on today's Community Cast. We hope that you were blessed by today's conversation. If you'd like to know more about Community Brookside, please feel free to visit us at our website, communitybrookside.com, or find us on your favorite social media outlet. We hope to hear from you soon. Be blessed.